Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Barry Erickson and I'm Community Engagement Coordinator at Wheaton Public Library. Tonight we are delighted to bring you another art demonstration in partnership with the DuPage Art League. Founded over 60 years ago, the DuPage Art League is dedicated to promoting and encouraging the visual arts through classes, workshops, gallery exhibits, and public programs such as this one. We are grateful to the DuPage Art League for arranging tonight's demonstration by acclaimed artist Spencer Meager. Spencer first discovered his love for art as a child, expressing himself through drawing and painting. He refined his skills over many decades with practice and dedication. As an adult, he has attended numerous workshops to gain a better understanding of his craft. Spencer now paints full-time and travels all over the country attending competitions and shows as well as teaching workshops. Spencer is a plein art and studio artist who works in watercolor, oil, and acrylic. When he's not traveling, he works out of his studio in Mount Vernon, Illinois. Spencer's work has taken top awards in art competitions around the country and has been exhibited in many notable galleries. His paintings have been featured in publications such as Southwest Art, Plein Air Magazine, and Plein Air Today. So with that, I will turn the screen over to you, Spencer. Thank you so much for being here tonight. All right. Well, thank you so much, Barry. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm excited about this. And uh, I want to show you tonight uh, just my approach to uh, painting as well as designing uh, for me, uh, the design, the competition or competition, the composition that you choose or that I choose or any artist chooses for their work is probably one of the most fundamental aspects of it. And it's basically the, the, the bones, the structure, the skeleton, if you will, of your, of your painting. And if you don't have a solid composition, a solid design, uh, you, you can do all the wonderful brushwork and color mixing and everything, but there will still be a, 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 an emptiness, a flaw in your work that will be noticeable. So uh, please feel free to ask any questions tonight. Uh, just type them into the chat. Barry will share them with me and I'll do my best to, to answer them for you. Uh, I'm also going to be showing you uh, you know, my approach to, to putting watercolor paint down on paper and uh, Hopefully, there's a lot of watercolor painters watching tonight. That uh, you know, you may you may see something you hadn't noticed before. You know, or, 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 or see me do something that you hadn't thought about. And, oh, that, that's a good idea. So, uh, hopefully, that'll be the case for you tonight. So, um, so I th I thought I would start here. Uh, let me change my screen where you can can see kind of a double screen here, uh, so you can watch me up in the corner if you want, or you can can see my uh, my table that I'm working on here. So, um, and I, I did not go, out, go into the house, Barry, and get that, that uh, image. Can you, can you bring that image up for us real quick? Is that possible, the reference image? Uh, yes, absolutely. So let me uh, remove the spot. You did say we were informal, right? <laughs> yes. So All let right. me share. So Barry's bringing up the reference image that I'm gonna be painting from tonight. Yeah, there, there it is right there. So this is about a mile, maybe two miles from my house. It's, I, I have a thing for water, water towers. Uh, I, I love painting them. Uh, I, I, if, if, if I can find one that's unique, it's, it's going to find its way into a painting. Uh, and what, what draws me to this is the, the curvature in the road there. I mean, that's just a natural, you know, I mean, that just guides your eye right into the painting. And then you've got this water tower with, with a little bit of color, the blue stripe on it, uh, just kind of rising up out of those trees. And you, you see different portions of the legs on it and such. Um, the, the white, you know, the contrast of the, the white of the tower against the blue sky. All, all of these things combine to make, make the scene for me in, intriguing. And um, I, like to, I like to say that I, I paint Americana a lot of a lot of the time. And uh, to me, this is kind of an Americana scene right here, just kind of a, a rural country highway that winds through some, some beautiful hardwood trees. And you've got this, these elements of uh, humanity in there. You got the power lines and the power poles and the water tower and stuff. And, um, but in, in and by of itself, it's not 
perfect. You know, uh, seldom do we find something in nature that is laid out just perfect. So it's our job as an artist to go ahead and move stuff around, Let's take things out of there, cut a few trees down if there's too many. Um, you'll notice here, I'll talk about it, but the house, you just see kind of a white rectangle on the, the kind of the lower right hand side. That's a, the uh, sunlit end of a, a double wide trailer, I think. Well, I'm going to, I, as I was sketching this out, I went ahead and decided that that needed to be more of a prom, prominent house. And I made it kind of like an old farmhouse, just the gable end of it with three windows in it and stuff. So, uh, but there's a lot of things in, in this scene that need to be adjusted. And so I'll, I'll talk about that. So Barry, if you want to bring, bring back my camera here, um, I will show them. Uh, this, this is the first sketch I did last night, and I just wanted to kind of uh, play around with this and, and see, you know, where do I want, like, the top of the road there? Where do I want the, uh, you know, these power poles? If you notice, there's a power pole that just bisects right, right through the water tower there. Well, I, I don't really like that. It, it kind of, for me, the water tower is the focal point, and it kind of cuts that cuts right into that and and destroys it so I, I in my final drawing here I've decided that needs to move over uh, but I do like like power poles and, and utility lines and all those things uh, they to me they add uh, so much excitement to a picture like, like uh, some of my favorite work is uh, city alleyways and if you get a, a good painter who puts in all the poles and all the wires running everywhere that can add so much energy to the picture. And, and so this one is kind of a candidate uh, in, in that respect as well. But, uh, and, and I'll just, people have questions I'm sure about what I, you know, my notebooks, sketchbooks, what watercolor paper I use, things like that. This is actually just a, a kind of a journal I picked up at um, uh, Staples. And if you're like me, you're kind of a, a paper junkie, you know, you like, you like, you find a cool looking notebook or whatever you like it and so you, you buy it well this this is just a journal but I, I used it as a sketchbook last night and used used ink on it here and just laid that out real quick and just a little uh, moment of truth I grabbed some uh, Prismacolor markers and started to shade this in to do a value study and this paper does not take to the Prismacolor markers it went right on through bled through onto that one so it just stays like it is but it helped, helped me understand. I looked, looked at all the details in there. It helped me understand what all is there and how basically the exercise of processing at one time, that helps me to refine it for the final painting. So then over here is on this page is a, a little thumbnail that I did a while ago. This is in pencil and it's just really rough, but I, I put the building in that house I was talking about. You can see it right here. I wanted it to, uh, I thought, you know, that would, that would break up all those those tree shapes there. You've got this solid wall of trees there, so to speak. And, you know, in watercolor, you, you know, you're just going to all be laying a wash in there. And it, it'll just be all one shape all the way across here. Uh, that shape will vary in color, but the value is probably going to stay about the same. And uh, I felt like, you know, it, it would benefit the picture to break, break that up with something non-organic, like, like a structure built by man. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to have these power poles coming up through there. You can see I moved that pole that was over here. It's cutting through the tower over here. I moved off to the side. This is just rough, quick, you know, just, just kind of getting a feel for it. Laid in some shadows down here on the road. And uh, so, it, again, it's helping me to figure out what I'm going to be doing when I actually get to the painting part of it. So then we get over here and on a watercolor block, and this is a, just so everybody sees what I'm painting on, it's a Blick Premier from Dick Blick, uh, cold press, a watercolor block. This is like a seven by 10. And uh, it's, a, it's a great paper. I love it. It, it behaves very much like Archer's paper and, and some of the uh, more expensive papers, but it's significantly less expensive than, uh, than the bigger name brands. So if you're uh, wanting to try out a new paper, I'd recommend that to you. But anyway, uh, so what I've done, I've, I taped off the border here. I do that quite a bit because uh, it, I can pull that tape off and I've got a 
a foam mat around it. It just cleans it up and makes the painting present itself uh, much stronger than if it's uh, painted out to the edges. So what I've done here, I've got uh, uh, looking for about three, maybe four values. Now in this value study, I, I think I have four values I, I counted. Uh, I've used a color called Moon Glow by Daniel Smith. Uh, it, it's a color that can go really dark. I can lighten it up and it has uh, nice elements of blue as well as red. And I'll lift this up and maybe hopefully you can see that right in here is, is some granulated blue pigment. Down here is some uh, granulated red pigment. So it, it brings an, an additional dimension to, the, to an otherwise monochromatic picture. Um, so what I, what I did with this, I started, started in by just laying in this lightest value that you see here all over the sky, down where the trees are, down into the, the ground down here where the leaves and, and the snow are at. And um, uh, just basically kind of did a, a uh, uh, well, it's monochromatic, but just, just like finding, finding the, defining them by two shapes, okay? Everything that was not white paper, uh, the sunlit end of the, the building, the sunlit portion of the tower, uh, little streaks of sunlight coming across here, little bits of sunlight hitting the, the, the power poles and things. Uh, everything other than that got, got this, the first medium value layer. Okay, then after that dries, I come back in and I mix up like a, a three fourths dark value here of pigment. And I lay that in for the trees and uh, for the shadow areas going across, across the road here. And then when I, uh, when I get that done, get that dry, then I come back in with almost a, like, like pure pigment and just put some key darks and like kind of get the shape of the road, the movement of the road there. And um, uh, it just, it just kind of, kind of sets, sets the tone, helps me realize. Now, by this time, I've done, been over this picture three times. And it just helps me to realize, okay, I, I need to make my shadows wider uh, or I need to maybe move it, uh, what, whatever it might be. Um, so anyway, and, and uh, somebody may be asking, okay, do you do a value study every time? No, I don't. Um, matter of fact, I, and I, I never draw a picture out three times like, like I've done right now. Uh, main reason I did that was so that when I'm showing you what I'm doing, I've got it locked in my mind so that I, that you get the best experience. But normally, I'll you know I'll do a, a quick sketch. I may do a value study, but most of the time I'll just if, I, if I'm doing plein air in particular, I'll do a quick sketch. Uh, I'll make some adjustments maybe with my pencil and eraser on it. Then I'll just dive right into the painting. And then uh, what what I've noticed here in the last oh I'm going to say probably the last year or so. I'm starting to draw more with my brush and rely less on my pencil marks. So I'll, I'll just do some quick suggestions of where the tree lines should be. And then I make adjustments as I'm painting. Something doesn't quite match my reference photo or doesn't quite match what's out in front of me. And then I'll, I'll just move stuff around with my brush. And it's very freeing. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, for myself, I'm really happy I've gotten to that point. Um, the other thing I would say is that there was a time when I would have masked out a lot of this, but I don't want to, um, I, I don't like relying on masking fluid unless I just really have to. I've got a couple bottles of it sitting off to the side here, but it just makes everything look so mechanical, uh, so stiff. And if you don't put it on just right, you can really gum up your picture and, and do damage to it. So I prefer just to try to negatively paint around things. So in this painting here, when I get, get rolling here in just a second with, with putting the, the water down and putting the color in, I'm going to paint negatively, which means painting around the white of the water tower here, the, the legs and everything. Um, I might, you might see me negatively paint around these power poles. Uh, but that's undecided yet in my mind. Uh, the house, I'll negatively paint around it. Uh, and then where you see... Uh, where, where you see the bright patches of snow down here, which you can't see that because you don't see the photograph that I'm looking at. Uh, but there are, are little spots. This was a light snow we had in November a couple of years ago. So most of the, most of the snow is gone, uh, but there's pockets of it that are popping through. So I'll just try to dry brush and let some of that show up. Um, 
and that'll all be done in the, the first go round. So, all right, with that, is there any questions or anything, Barry, that, that, that anybody Yes, there are actually a, a couple questions about the process as, as we just get started here. Uh, what color was it that you used in painting that thumbnail? Uh, uh, the really value like study here is a, tones in it. It's yeah. a Daniel Smith Moon Glow, okay. and it's it's kind of a grayed purple. It's kind of like a oh like a Payne's gray maybe, except it's got more violet in it. It's got got more red. Payne's Payne's gray kind of is a bluish cast. Great. And uh, it, it, I just like it because it has elements of blue and red that that organically come out, and uh, it just adds another dimension to the to the picture. So. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, do you, do you start your value study with a pencil drawing? You were talking about the the give and take with the pencil and and painting as you're doing sketches. If you could just tell yeah. us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So just uh, just like you see right here, I sketched something like this, equivalent to that, out on this this paper right here. Of course, it was taped off, so I sketched that out, and then I just started with this by laying in the sky and of this value and then carrying that value down across everything that does not stay white. And um, then I, I come back with the next value and fill in anything that is, is somewhat darker. Uh, obviously the trees in the distance there, the shadows that are cast by trees that are off to the side here. And I through either three or four values, I, I build the design up but I'm simplifying the design. Um, and the best way to simplify it is just to isolate shapes. In other words, and let, let me bring this over here where everybody can see it. Hopefully it won't, won't glare back at you. So here's, here's what I'm looking at. I'm working off my iPad and I see, let me find, find a pointer here. Okay, so the skies, I look at this, obviously the water tower and this old house that's right here, you know that that's that's one value and then there's elements of sunlit snow right along in here right over in here uh we've got a little mailbox right here that i i'm i'm glad i'm talking about this because i'd forgotten about that i had actually thought about masking that out so i'm going to do my very best to remember that but that little mailbox is just a little little highlight a little snippet of something interesting that's just disappearing over the crest of the hill and things like that can help pull your viewer viewer in, they're naturally going to follow the road, but then you give them a little treat right there and that, this little white spot and they can, they can wonder what it is, you know, maybe they'll, they'll figure it's a mailbox or they might think, well, maybe it's a sign or something like that, but it's something to, to spark interest. Also, you can see there's a, uh, uh, oh, it looks like a chartreuse sign there, but I'm sure that's a, just an orange sign, uh, some kind of a road sign. I probably won't put, put that in there, but if you look over here, you can see that there's, there's snow over here as, as well. And uh, so anything that is white is the, is the raw paper. Then I have to decide, okay, what's the next value? Well, for me, it's, it's the sky. And I take that value and I paint over everything that is not gonna be white. And then when, when that's dry, then I create my next deeper value. Remember, I'm shooting for three to four values with the white paper being one value. Okay, so uh, I've got to simplify everything and just squeeze it down if it's, if it's close to, uh, the same value as something that it's next to, they get mushed together in, in the, the scheme of the value. And so, uh, you know, these trees are all, if I squint at them, they're all basically the same value. So I just see that as one organic tree shape that goes all the way over to here, comes down to the, the land here and goes back over. That's one shape. Then to take it a step further, that same shape by value, not by subject or by color or anything, but by value, that same shape actually carries itself down into this area down in here, as well as some of the shadow area over here and even parts of the road. And hope, hopefully when you see me paint, a lot of this will be, become much clearer to you. Um, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it's just a process of simplifying, moving things around, editing things out that, that don't add to your picture, and then condensing down the basic shapes of it. That's where you get your strongest paintings from. Um, for me, I'm, I'm looking around here, I got paintings scattered everywhere, but for me, I want a painting, or, or if, 
I feel my paintings are most successful if when somebody walks in a gallery or a show or whatever, and they're 30, 40 feet away, and they see something, they see it across the room because the like the big shape of this water tower grabs their attention. You know, they know instantly what they're looking at, and it, it just pulls them across the room. And you can really only do that if, if you've broken your painting up into these larger shapes. If you've got a lot of busyness going on in there, it, it, it gets a little chaotic and hard to read at a distance. And uh, for me, I, I just don't feel it's, it's as strong as, as uh, something that's more simplified. So. And we've got another question that relates to the composition. Do you use the, the one third rule as you're setting up your objects and, and maybe placing your horizon? Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not big into rules because I find it's as soon as I say a rule, I break a rule. But um, I, I seldom put the horizon right in the middle of the picture. There are times when you can do it, when you can get away with it. Let's just. Let's just take a, a quick measurement here and see where this one comes out. Okay, so there, there's the, the horizon, so to speak. And here's where I'm measuring from. So if I go up there, I'm pretty close to right in the center. But you've got all these trees here and this roller coaster organic shape that serves as, serves as a distraction. Yes, this is, this is the horizon line of the land, but these trees go so far up they compensate for that rule. And so um, for me, I, I'm a visual person. And yeah, there, there's rules and principles that, that you adhere to, you know, like uh, bigger shapes, fewer shapes, uh, blend values together, that kind of thing. Those are, those are all principles that make a stronger painting. But there's not a, I've not seen a hard, fast rule that, that you've got to adhere to every single time. Uh, because every time I every time in a class I tell tell them, you know, this is what you don't want to do. I'll end up breaking that rule in that class every single time, and uh, so I, I I try not to do that too much. So, okay, and uh, let's just take a, a couple of people are asking about the masking tape that you use. If there's any particular type of of, of tape. All right, so here is the masking tape that you see around this painting right here. It is Sherwin Williams, inch and it's masking tape doesn't come in like inch inch and a half it's a, i think it comes in metrics so it's this is the closest one to an inch and a half and i i picked that based upon the the proportions of the the painting i'm doing so this painting is this is a 12 by 16 watercolor block you you can see it's at that blick premiere it's a 12 by 16 watercolor block um I, and again, I like to tape them off just so I can peel it off and I got a nice crisp edge. The, the painting when I'm done, it looks finished. It looks like it's already framed up. Uh, so if I'm using, working on something smaller like that, I'll use a narrower tape, just like that. Like, so this is about an inch. If I'm working on a 12 by 16, I'll use inch and a half tape. If this was a 15 by 22 or something along those lines there, I would probably get closer to two inch tape on there because I want, want that white border around it to be proportionate to it. Uh, you know, if I put that one inch tape around this, it would just, it, it would look oddball. So trial and error over the years is, is what's gotten me to that point, so. Okay, oh. thank you. Well, I think the, the next couple of questions are relate to you getting started. So why don't we let you do that? Okay, all right. So, uh, and I'm, you guys can see, of course, you can see what I'm painting on here. Let me get, get this out of the way or I'll end up splattering paint on it. Um, you can also see my, my palette here and uh, colors appear a little bit dark on screen maybe, but I think you can, uh, you can probably tell close enough to what they are. Real quick, I'll run through them. Um, I'm, I, my palette's constantly evolving, okay? But tonight, <laughs> tonight I've got like a, a cad yellow here. A, a lemon yellow. Uh, lemon yellow pretty well is a constant on there. Once in a while, I'll throw in a quinacridone gold. Um, phthalo green is always a constant on my palette. I use it uh, very faithfully in almost every painting. Uh, that's a cerulean blue. I hardly ever use it. Uh, over here is cobalt blue, a mainstay. I use it all the time. I used to have uh, ultramarine blue on my palette, but then uh, I realized that I could add a little bit of red to cobalt and get an ultramarine. And so, I, well, there's no point in uh, having both those out there when I can 
to when I can so easily mix it. And um, so anyway, uh, I've got cobalt here, then I've got phthalo blue here, which I, 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 I use it frequently, but not near as much as I do the cobalt blue. Okay, this is that, that moon glow by Daniel Smith, what I did the value study with. Um, I pull this out, maybe get a little better light on it. Um, this is alizarin crimson. I used to use it like crazy in every painting, but I started drifting away from it. And there's not a logic to it. It's just, it, it just not I'm, feel, not, I'm not feeling it anymore. So I don't use it near as much. This is a permanent rose, an opera, permanent magenta, it, any of those colors. Uh, I tend to use it more than I use the alizarin crimson. Then this is, uh, I actually think this is American Journey, which is Cheap Joe's, and that's Red Hot Mama. Uh, but it's, a, it's like a cad, cad red light, something like that. And then this is a color that I, I, I'm usually not specific on brands, okay? Like, like a raw sienna, you know, uh, there's a, a thousand different brands of it out there, and you can use whatever brand of that you want. Uh, but this this is core transparent pyrrole orange, and it I've never seen a color like it. Core Q O R makes it. It's made by Golden, uh, people that make the acrylics. It's a magnificent color and it's so powerful. Hope hopefully I'll be using it in in this and maybe throw it into these this tree over here or something like that. And if I do, you you watch it. If this is wet and I put it in there, it's just good. It just blossoms out, just explodes. So uh empty color well uh that's a color i don't use anymore it's american journey copper kettle it's like burnt sienna uh but it's on steroids it's a, it's a great color but i just i just don't use it that much raw sienna i use that all the time um used to like windsor newton uh and i use it to get, get transitions in skies to go from blues into yellows without going green but they've done something to the windsor newton and it, it starts going green on me a little bit so uh, I, I, I'm on the hunt for another raw sienna. I'll just put it that way. Nothing against Windsor Newton. They're a great, great paint, great product. It just they've done something and it's not meeting my needs anymore. And then over here is neutral tint, which is uh, just a neutral dark gray. Great, great paint to use for doing the value studies and things like that. It's a little lifeless. The, the moon glow's got that red and that blue uh, issue going on in it. This is just gray is all it is. And then these colors right here are different grays from American Journey that I haven't used them in years. They just, they get to live on in my palette is all. So, uh, so anyway, those are my colors that I use. And I wanna start out um, with laying in uh, some cobalt. I'll probably mix a little bit of, um, probably a little bit of phthalo green with it up here. And then as I, as I bring, my, bring it down, just like doing the value study, I'm gonna lay that blue over everything, the, the shadows down here, anything that is not white paper. And it, it just kind of helps me to get my, my bearings on the painting and how I, want, how, I, how I want the painting to go and how I see the painting going. Uh, but what I've gotta be careful to remember is that I leave, I'm gonna try to leave a, put a sketch right here. Remember to leave that little mailbox there. I'll bet you $10 bill I painted out, but I'm going to try to remember that. Um, so when, when I get my first, first layer done here, everything's either going to be white or blue in this and hopefully be about the same value. So, all right. Um, I've Spencer, got a lot. Can we, take, uh, can we take just a couple of questions about colors before you really get started again? Yes, uh, so, absolutely. Uh, someone is asking, do you use fresh paint each time or it, it sounds like you're in, in your palette. Are you putting in fresh paint each time? I'm replenishing this. Uh, now tonight, before, before we went on the air, I looked it over and everything was in pretty, I think I, this is the only color I put in the yellow right there, that's which you can't see. There you go. You didn't get to see that a while ago. Uh, that yellow there, the, that cad yellow, that's what I, I put in. The rest of it was in, in pretty good shape. When you use good paints, a good, good professional grade paints, um, you know, they, they will, they will stay, they will reconstitute real easy. Like, like this paint right here has been there. I'm going to say that paint's probably been there seven years and I can take and touch it right now. See how they, that came up on my finger. Just like that right there. It's, it's good paint that never goes bad. And so really, and, and I'll say this, 
to everybody because I know the temptation is to buy the cheaper paints and, and like, well, I'm not, maybe you think well, I'm not that good. I don't need the good stuff. You need the good stuff because it's really cheaper in the long run because you can buy, uh, you know, let, let's say uh, you go to one of the, the craft stores and you buy a, a $20 box of watercolor paints. Well, those are probably going to, before you get them used up, they'll probably harden up in the tube and, and be useless to you. Uh, where the good paints won't do that. So in the long run, it, it's actually cheaper for you to buy the good stuff to start with. And then of course the results you get are gonna be just head and shoulders above the results you get with the cheaper stuff, so. Right, and uh, someone who is asking just for names again, uh, the names of the green that you were using? Um, Thalo Green, T-H-A-L-O, it's actually P, P-T-H-A-L-O, or if you wanna get, use the long scientific version, it's Thalo Cyanine Green but uh, just phthalo green, phthalo green, and phthalo blue right here. Okay, and uh, the name of that, that orange paint, you kind of talked that about is, it like it was almost magical. <laughs> it is, it is, it is magical. That's a good way to put it. Uh, Core, Q-O-R, that's the manufacturer, which is golden paints. They make the, the good acrylic paints. Core, transparent, pyro, P-Y-R, I think it's P Y R R O L E, pyrrole orange. The key is transparent. Um, there's, I think, like Daniel Smith makes a, a pyrrole orange, and it's a vibrant orange, but it's opaque. This is transparent, so that when you put it in there, not only does it just take over and dominate, but it, it has this translucence about it that is really, really quite beautiful. And one of the things with with watercolor is. You know, I'll lay this blue in here and that kind of sets the stage. And then I lay subsequent colors over it when I lay in washes on top of that. And the blue, if you cut the colors on top are transparent, the blue then comes through and it gives you a, a depth to it that you can't achieve in any other medium. Okay, and one last question is just mm -hmm. about that moon glow. Uh, someone asks, are you concerned about using uh, fugitive colors like moon glow in your work? Um, no, not really, because my work is not going to be exposed to direct sunlight. Typically, you know, it it can hang in somebody's house uh, and and hang near a window that's going to flood it over time. But uh, a, a lot of times, I'll varnish my paintings too, my watercolors, and that's that's a trend that's out there right now in the watercolor world, and it's it's not a bad thing to do. But the painting is done. Once, once you put the, the, the archival varnish over it, it's got UV protectant in it, painting's done. You can't go in and alter it unless you go and work on it like with acrylics on top of it. Um, but I, I always feel good about that, putting that, that UV protector over it, because then I know that it's not going anywhere. And I've done tests on it, uh, as have other artists that I know, where they'll, they'll paint a quick little painting, they'll uh, block off one side with a piece of paper, tape it down, and the other side is left unprotected, and they will put it out in the, in, uh, in the window or something for a year and come back and peel that, that up, and there's no difference between what was protected and what had the UV spray on it. So uh, it, it, it really does help protect them. Uh, and like I say, I do that some, uh, pretty, pretty much with my, my uh, plein air work, I, I varnish it and actually display it uh, with no glass or nothing over it. Uh, and there's, yeah, there's, there's no problem with it, so. And what type of varnish is it that you use? Krylon, uh, Krylon UV archival varnish. Maybe at a break here, I'll, I've, I've got about six cans of it, about 10 feet from me, I can see them right now. Uh, maybe at a break, if you remind me, I'll walk over there and get, get the can and sh show it to you, it's a spray can. And uh, you just spray it on, re really two, three layers, and, it, and it's, it's good to go, protects it from moisture. You know, obviously, if you drop it in the bathtub or something, it's it's not going to protect it. But for just everyday wear and tear around somebody's house, dust getting on it, it it's perfectly fine. And you just use the varnish, and you don't. Do you also put wax on it? Um, good question. There is a there is a, a a painter that I got to paint with last fall who wrote really nice watercolors, and he does use cold wax on top of his, and um. It, it adds a protectant to it. Uh, it adds a dull luster to it, uh, depending on how much you buff it out. 
but I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I can recommend that yet. I've, I've not really done that on watercolor. I've done it on acrylics and on oils, putting that, that cold wax on there. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to reserve comment on that as to whether that's, that's a plus or a minus uh, till after I've done it and satisfied myself on it. Uh, but if, I wouldn't hesitate to tell somebody else to try to do that, you know, if they're, if they're, if they want to give it a whirl. Sure. Okay. Well, we'll let you go ahead and get started with painting. All right. So uh, I start paintings in all, all different ways. Um, but in, in this particular case, uh, because I want to control where the where this blue goes and I want it, want it to be wet so that it flows. Uh, when, I, when I paint, I typically paint pretty wet. So I'm just going to wet my paper around, negatively paint the water around the, the areas that I want to preserve as whites, like the water tower, the house, that little sign. Uh, actually, I have another house over here um, that I, I just slipped in there. It may turn into a house. I may paint it out. Who knows? Um, and then when I get down here, I'll probably go and kind of go into dry brush mode uh, so that I can keep areas of, of that snow showing through there. So, so I'm going to start here. And this, this water is kind of dirty. It's, it's just because I've been cleaning my brush and it's tainted with a little bit of blue, but that's all right. It's not going to hurt anything. It's going to get blue put over it anyway. Okay, so I'm just trying to be cautious as I lay this in, not, not be overly tight. That's one of my nemesis, I guess that's the right way to say it, nemesis to uh, painting tight, as it is with most, most painters. You know, they, we all struggle to paint loose. And uh, I've never heard a painter say, I want to paint tighter. I just, I just never have, so. I think we're all in pretty good company. So I'm just wet, wetting this here. Come in here underneath the water tower, between the, the uprights there. And this brush I'm using is an inch and a half. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's a synthetic brush. I bought it at my first watercolor workshop that I went to back in the early, early 90s. And it is still an excellent brush. I don't have any idea what the brand of it is, uh, I, but I absolutely love that brush. It just, it comes to a nice razor's edge. See that right there? That, I mean, that's, that's a good, good brush that will do that right there. It's got a, a thicker belly on it, so it holds a lot of, lot of moisture. Okay, now you see this, uh, I'm gonna try something here if I can. I may have messed it up. That power pole right there, I'm just gonna leave a little, uh, I wanna say a white strip there, but I'm leaving a, a dry strip right there. Uh, so it gets the appearance of being negatively painted around. Try to mix up the way I, I paint those. Okay, right there is the, that little mailbox. So I'm, I haven't forgot it yet. The painting is early though, I, I got plenty of time to mess it up. Okay, there's the house, painting over the trees, Every, everything, if it's not white, it's gonna get, get blue laid over it. All right, and if you can see right here, let me lift this up for you. You see these, these, hash, these shade lines I put in there, just, just like that? That helps me to remember what's dark and what's light. So uh, just a, a, a little bit of information there for you. Kind of a cheat rule, I guess. All right. Yeah, I'm getting ready to come in here and, uh, um, you know, just kind of skip around, leave, leave some of this white popping through. Just a little bit more and then I'll grab some color and you'll get to see it start to develop. Keep your shadows nice and loose. Remember this whole side over here. Again, I know you, you can't see the photograph, but it, if you can kind of think back, this is all shadowed over here. Sun's coming from off to my right here, cutting across the painting. So it's casting these long shadows that, that work their way up onto this bank over here. Put a little bit of blue on there. All right, that's good enough. Throw that brush aside. Okay, let's have a little fun with some color here. So I'm trying to get a 
maybe a little bit of an aqua uh, blue sky. I, I want a little little aspect of, of uh, green in there. And let's see, my picture went out. So let me bring that back up. It's the only bad thing about a iPad. They time out on you. All right, so let's come up here and just start laying in some, some blue. So by wetting that paper, it has bought me some time. I don't have to be in a, a panicked hurry to, to get across here. And then uh, get over here. I'll just show you right here. So there's a pole right there. I'm going to come down and negatively paint around it. And I'll do the same thing right here. And hopefully you'll be you'll be able to pick that up on the on the camera. I'll do the same thing right here with this one. I've got them reseeding down. As this develops, I'll tell you a little bit more about what I'm thinking as far as uh, you know the process of, of designing this and laying everything out. But right now I'm laying the sky and I kind of need to focus on that, trying to get it, get it as good as I can. Okay, I'm noticing on the screen it looks it is it is blue, but there's a little more of a greenish cast than what you're you're seeing. So, just full disclosure there. Okay, and remembering that's a house that's getting illuminated just like that one. So, for now, I'm just painting around it. We'll we'll see. I might change my mind here in a little bit. Okay, and I'd also tell you too that I paint. I'll try to keep my hand out of the camera's way, but I uh, paint on a little bit of an angle, and I'll talk about that more here in just a second. Actually, need to go back to my bigger brush, I think. I found that if I use a larger brush, I get a much smoother finish than if I'm using something smaller. I was using a three quarter inch there, but I'm starting to see all these brush strokes in there, and I don't want that. So I'm just going to come back in and re-energize this with some water, water and pigment. Bringing this down. Oop, there you did it. Painted over my mailbox. I knew I would. At least I'm honest about it. But it it doesn't ruin anything to paint over it. You know, you just make make it work another way. Okay, so it's, it's starting to lighten up down there. I like that. Okay, and I'm down here to the trees. And uh, I try to stop, like I brought the sky down right there. And that's kind of risky in watercolor because then when you go back in, if you don't match the moisture in it, you can get an edge there. But where I broke that was down inside the trees. So the trees are going, going to get laid over the top of that and they're going to cover up any imperfection that might, might have been there. So you want to try to plan those things out as well. Okay, and then this is a tree cutting right along there. I'm just going to keep working my way down now. Uh, but now is where I got to, got to kind of pay attention here to you know, what is, what is white, white snow? What is shadow area? A little bit of shadow there. Too much water puddling up right there. So I'll just take my paper towel and blot that before it messes things up for me. One thing too I've learned is you don't, don't, don't push the panic button. When something doesn't go quite the way you, you had envisioned it, well, it may work out even better. Maybe your vision wasn't as good as what, uh, what the painting's wanting to do. Okay. So I'm just about done with this step here. Let me slide my iPad back a little where I can see my picture better. So as I get down here, I've got a lot of raw sienna and, and stuff. So, um, or that will be raw sienna, it's grass and things like that. But as I, I lay the colors in, you'll see that develop. Kind of running out of paint right here. Get a little more water, a little more paint. 
drop that in there. Now that's just some pure cobalt blue. You can see that, I think you can see the difference in that between what's, what I've been putting on. Okay, we'll come down and make this cut across the road like so. And then just, uh, I modified the shadow right in here just to kind of get a little bit of uh, something a little more interesting to look at there. And uh, I will show you the, show you and explain to you what I'm thinking here. Okay, so let me get, get this laid in here and then I'll, I'll comment about it. I got an idea to leave the white, white stripe there of the road, or it could be snow on it. So, okay. So, um, in the photograph, there, this is just kind of patchy right down here, but I, I never like to have, uh, and I've got a white right there, but it, again, I'm going to be laying layers of color over this. I never like to have a white in a corner. You know, any of these corners, I like to have color in there. Uh, and I like usually to have it as a darker value. So what that does, that serves to push the viewer up into, into the center of the picture. And um, so by, by virtue of, of manipulating these shadows, now they, I mean, th there are literally hundreds of them coming across there, just little thin strips. If I paint all those, it's, it's going to be so busy and it's not going to be pleasing to the viewer's eye or or they're subconscious, they're just, they're just not going to like it. So what I do then, I could just, I, I combine or condense, if you will, a bunch of those narrow shadows into one broader shadow. And so I've got one, two, three, four shadows marching up that hill right there. And that says, that's enough information to the viewer that they, they know, hey, there's, there's trees or a building or something there casting these shadows across there. And, and they're, their subconscious is pleased with what they're seeing. If I had 13 or 14 of them in there, it would, it would just be too much. Okay. And then um, I, the shadows really in the photograph really stop right there, but I felt like I needed to have to fill this corner here. So I just brought another shadow across over here and all, all the way down. So now as I'm looking at this, I've got all my light areas up here, the bulk of them are up there and that's where I want the viewer to look. And that's, that's where they're going to. So, all right, let me, let me blot up a few of these little spots like this right here. If I leave that dry on its own, it's going to wick back up in there and create a blossom as will that and that and that. So I just take a, a, a damp paper towel, touch the corner of it to it and drink it up, get most of it out and it's, it'll be good to go. All right, Barry, you got any questions you want to uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, perhaps the angle or tilt of the block that you're painting on? Yep, I sure can. So I'm going to be, I'm going to set this down flat and you can see this block that's underneath here. It's just a wooden block. I carpeted it. Um, actually, if you can see behind me or over here on this side, uh, same carpeting on the wall there, uh, just kind of cuts down on the sound and creates a better environment than the white painted wall. But I just took a scrap block of, of lumber and wrapped carpet around it because, again, I used to have that carpet on this table here. Um, so it, it kind of matched in and look, looks a little better. But this is about, that's about two and a half, three inches high. If you can, I'll lay my finger on there so you, you get an idea, you know, how, just how big that is or how tall that is. So if I'm working on a 12 by 16, I'm, I'm probably at about a three or four degree angle. Let's say if, if this is a flat surface here, I'm probably painting about like that. If I'm using a shorter block like that seven by 10, it tends to be at a little harsher angle. The angle to me isn't quite as important. I just want enough angle so that it keeps the paint moving, keeps the water moving to the bottom. And that helps the painting to kind of paint itself. And, uh, it's like if I, if I was looking around here, if, if I'm doing plein air, I'm working off of a, a tripod or an easel, and I'm usually painting at a, you know, at a really harsh angle. Let me get my hand right here at a, you know, probably, probably almost, almost vertical. 
uh, and I paint in watercolor that way and it, and it works just fine. So, all right, if I can run my hair dryer real quick on this, um, get it to dry it out and we'll be able to move on to the next. You wanna mute me, Barry? Sure. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then whenever you're done with the hair dryer, Spencer, you'll need to unmute yourself. There we go. Okay, so I said that I love painting water towers. There's another watercolor that, that I did of our local water tower here. Uh, you know, it's not just your standard run of the mill water tower. It's it's vintage, if you will. It's got some age to it. And I remember seeing this. Um, a hot late July or August day, it was just, uh, the sun was just cutting across that so strongly and had all these clouds in the back that just really, really spoke to me. And I remember I took a picture of it and I was gonna paint it. And then I, I you know, digital, it goes into the cloud and I never could find that photo again. And I was just like sick. Next summer, I happened to be going by there uh, along about the same time of the year, same kind of day, the clouds were coming up and I got me another photograph of it. And uh, so this, this is what I painted. But you know, I, I find beauty in the most unusual things, you know, just the, the commonplace stuff that we would normally pass by. And um, so anyway, water, water towers are one of them. So I, I, I just love painting. Okay, were, were there more questions? Uh, well, someone is asking about how much water you're using. For instance, do you dip uh, your brush in water uh, before the pigment? Uh, um, you know, that, that I, I would say yes, that, that's kind of a, a hard thing to answer because it's just kind of instinctual when I do it. Um, you know, I'm not really thinking about a formula, okay, I need to dip this or whatever. I just, I just feel it as I'm painting, you know, I'm looking at, at how the paint is behaving on the palette um, and based on what I know that it's going to do when it hits the paper, you know, does it need more water to it? Do I need to add a little more pigment? You may see me go back and forth, you put more color in, get more water, get more color, and do that six or seven times. It's just, you know, visually something doesn't look right to me. And I, when I, when it, when I'm, I get there, I'll know it. And that's when I, when I start painting. So. Okay, and then let's just take this uh, question about your palette. Someone was asking about what type of palette that is, since there's such okay. nice large areas uh, for mixing and to handle those bigger brushes. All right, there you can see the colors pretty good. Now get them, get them over here in the, the main light. Okay, so you see this AP on here, right there? That's Anderson Products. That is uh, the, the company that makes it. Um, I get a lot of questions on this. It's a 20 well, and it has basically four mixing areas, three small ones, which this one really doesn't count as much of a mixing area because you know you got the, your thumb thumb well right there. But just like an artist palette, you can you can hold it just like that. Um, when I, I use this plein air painting, and I'll I'll have a tray that I lay it on. Um, of course, I use it in the studio like I'm doing now. 
you have this nice large lid here that you can mix in. So it's, it's really very functional. And this palette, um, matter of fact, the last watercolor class I, I taught online, the, the uh, facilitator looked it up because I get this question a lot. They looked it up and I think it's now at $25 for this palette. It used to be pre-COVID, it used to be like $17, something like that. Uh, but like everything else, you know, they go up in price. But uh, it, I, I've had this one probably eight, maybe maybe 10 years, I don't, I don't know. Um, and I've got, I bought, bought another one. I've got another one around here somewhere. I, when I find, find something I like, I tend to, tend to buy several of them just to have them. Um, just like these cups right here, I'll hold it up to that camera there. Uh, I can't collapse it because it has water in it, but this ring shoves down and, and it's only this high when it's all collapsed. And then uh, that's great for putting in your backpack if you're gonna plan air paint, a real space saver. Plus it, it will fit in the hole in the tray that I paint on um, that, you know, that uh, is designed to hold a cup. Well, th this fits right in a cup holder too. So um, but anyway, anyway, and most of the time, like right now I've got two buckets of water. There's a lot of times when I'm painting outside, I just use one bucket of water. I, and just a couple of follow up questions. It, was that palette metal or plastic? It is aluminum and it's uh, enameled. So it's, it's kind of got like a porcelain feel to it. Uh, and it's, it's held up real good. It's, it's chewed up a little bit right here for some unknown reason. I've, something's chewed through the surface of the, the, the enameled surface, but it doesn't flake or anything. It just, it, it just got a, a scar on it basically. So it's and, real and, lightweight, real lightweight. Right, if it and, has any, any negative, it's sometimes like, you know, I, I close it like that. And then when it's in my, my uh, backpack, if it gets squished, it, the top may slide down over the bottom. And then you got to kind of struggle a little bit to pry it apart. But that, that's the only negative to it. And what did those uh, letters AP stand for again? Anderson Products. Great. Thank you. Yep. You, you, know, <laughs> you can buy them at Blick, Cheap Joe's. You know, I mean, they're Jerry's Artorama. They're everywhere. Okay. And you've talked a little bit about uh, working plein air as well as obviously in your studio. Do you have kind of, is there a percentage of time that you do one or the other? Do you have a preference? I do a lot of plein air competitions uh, and those typically run from March to the end of October. So I'm on the road a lot and painting outside a lot uh, during that season of the year. In the wintertime, I don't do a lot of plein air only because I'm busy doing other things, um, teaching workshops or catching up on work around the house that I've needed to do while I was gone all summer. And uh, so I, I, most of my plein air is, is in the, the warmer months of the year. But I have done winter plein air before at a competition in Wisconsin, and uh, we were out painting the 13 below, and it was, uh, it was a good experience. So it wasn't watercolor, though. It was oil. Right. Well, and, and one last question. Can, uh, is there a brand on that water cup, the collapsible water cup? Someone was curious um, about that. There is. Um, and I just, I just bought one the other day. Um, but I don't, here, here it is right here, but I don't think it's got a name on it. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there is. Okay. So here's what it looks like collapsed. This is a brand new one. You just pop it out like that. And then when you just collapse it like that. And uh, this is a Faber-Castell, which everybody's familiar with them. They make a lot of pencils and things like that. Just a Faber-Castell collapsible water cup. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I think that exhausts most of the questions for now. Why don't you go ahead and, and go on with the next step of the painting? Okay. So uh, what, what I tell people is, you know, you get to see my process, uh, which is not always pretty because I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to do until I start in like, like right now, I, I can't tell you what my next step is. I've, I've got to study where I'm at, look at the photograph that's in front of me, look at, um, you know, what I've, what I've got done here. <clears throat> and right now, what I'm feeling is the right thing to do is to come in with some raw sienna, and probably some of that core transparent pyrrole orange. We'll, we'll see. 
but come in and just lay in these these trees uh, with that and bring it down into the dark areas here. And, and Barry, it might be a good time to bring that that photograph back up so everybody can be refreshed as to what we're uh, what we're looking at. Sure, let me do that. And if if we get a, a break here in just a little bit, I'll try to run into the where the printer is at and get that the one I printed off so I can lay it out here in front of me. Okay, um, so you you see there are the the trees that are on the well, you know you got that more of a, a orangey or, br or browner one there to the left, and as they work to the right, they get a little greener and stuff. So I'm I'm thinking what I'll do is I'll start with. Uh, the uh, raw sienna on the left, that, that browner tree, and I'll work my way across down along the road there up the bank. And as I go that way, I'll probably start throwing some yellows and some, some blues in there to get kind of the greenish cast. And I'll just, just work my way all the way over, probably throw a little bit of that core transparent pyrrole orange in just, just to brighten it up and, and liven it a little bit. And um, then from there, I'm, I'm guessing I'll go down and do the fallen leaves that are in the yard on the left, and then the ditch bank there that has the dead grass uh, showing up on it. Then I'll hop over to the other side, and there's, there's some greener grass in that ditch and some dead grass and stuff. So I'm just basically, again, thinking of those shapes back when I did the value study, I'm, I'm just going to treat everything that is organic. The, the trees and the grasses and the dead leaves, I'm going to treat them as one shape at this time. I'm going to try to paint them all together, paint them for the most part the same value, but just changing the colors up a little bit. So the colors will stay the same value for the most part, but but uh, uh, but there, there's not going to be a lot of, this area is brighter or, or darker than this one at this point. It's just going to be uh, just a, a color transition, so or as they call it, a color shift. All right, so if you can clear that and spotlight me again, and uh, I will get some of this raw sienna going here. Now I tell myself I'm going to do this every time, and that's fill up, you know, squirt out new paint every time, and I never do. And if I did, I wouldn't have to sit here and scrub around on this raw sienna to try to get enough of it out for me to use. But if you get nothing out of this demo other than this, you'll realize I'm just, just a regular painter like everybody else. Nothing special. I just have my way of doing it. And I, I take shortcuts that often end up biting me. So. All right. Somebody was asking a minute ago about, well, you know, how much water do I dip my brush beforehand right now? See what I'm doing? I'm, I'm going until I get enough pigment mixed up out here, as well as go and pick up a little more water. All right, now I've got some blue here. I got a little bit of phthalo green there, which I might use that, but more likely I'll come over here and grab some one of these yellows over here to shift that color as I go across. But again, like I said, I don't know. I, I just don't know until I start painting. Keep my, my paints pretty wet. All right, so let's go right in here and start in. So you can see by laying that, that raw sienna, it's kind of a yellow. You lay that right over the, the, that blue and it starts to give you a, a little more of a vibrant, vibrant color. And I, uh, looking at the screen there, I can see that it's it's glaring for you, but that's that it may not be comfortable to look at, but it at least shows you how much moisture I'm using there. So, okay, and I'm going right over this power pole here. Matter of fact, I'm just gonna put a suggestion of it in there right now. So I was supposed to be down in Texas at Big Bend right now and things developed where I wasn't able to do that. But I was also very leery that I was going to be, get down there in a place I was unfamiliar with, never been to before and their Wi-Fi might not be sufficient. So I'm working from my studio right now and I'm really grateful that I'm here. 
I wanted to go to Big Ben, but I'm glad that I'm here. I, I feel a lot, a lot more uh, secure here, I guess, that things are going to develop. You know, I can control them better here. All right. Now, again, I'm looking at the photo that you can't see, but here's the grass or the yard with the, the dead leaves in it. So I'm just, again, treating that as I'm treating those trees right there. There's a, a, like a driveway right there that's snow covered. So you see that's that's starting to take shape there. Now I'm gonna, I've modified the tree line and we'll, we'll show you these, the photo again here in just a little bit. I've modified this tree line to, to make it what I, I think is a little more exciting and interesting. It just kind of squeezes down in the photograph here and I've opened it up a little, but I've, you know, I've got, got the license to modify it as I, as I see fit at any given time. Make that tree just a little, little bigger in scale there. Okay, this comes up and there's actually a little, the house building something right there. I don't know what it is. And I think it's just kind of clouds the issue. So I'm gonna leave it out. I wanna come over here and paint around the, that, that up right there for that. And Go just like that. Let me get real quickly, get these put in here. Okay, now here's a, here's a little painting tip for you. You notice how I'm negatively painting around portions of these power poles that are here. If I come over to here, I can, I've got a, a stopping point right there where I don't have to get paint all the way across here and then try to scurry to catch up to that. So it gives me just a little bit of time. I'm painting fairly moist and that, that, that buys me a lot of time. I'm gonna grab some of this core transparent pyrrole orange here. And I'll, I'll try to show you on my palette how powerful this color is. You, you can see that it's a, it's a nice bright orange. You probably also see there's a hair coming out of that brush right there. So I'm going to take that and just drop that in over here. That's pretty in, intense. By that, I mean it's pretty opaque at, at this point because that's starting to dry on me there. So I'm just going to kind of, with water, just kind of help it along. I don't want it to be screaming orange, but I, I want it to add a little bit of color and vibrancy to this painting. Another thing that, I, that has really become apparent to me as, as I paint in the last few, few years, um, you know, lay, laying these colors in, uh, the, um, I'm losing my train of thought here. I got, I'm thinking about something else. It'll come back to me. Give me just a couple of minutes. If that ever happened to anybody else, you forget what you were going to say. Mom always told me, she said, well, if you can't remember what it was, it must not have been very important. I'm br bringing that orange down there. Ed Bernard, I know I had a really good point I wanted to make to you. Something that was probably going to really wow you. Okay, so I'm, I'm liking that. We got some nice, nice orange feeling right there. Nice fall, autumn, autumn colors. I'm going to carry that over just a little bit here. Get my iPad screen. I'm trying desperately to preserve that little white mailbox there. I'm doing pretty good that, that way. So I'm deviating here a little bit, uh, carrying the orange over, but I'm gonna drop some, some other color in there here. Like I'm gonna come in with this, uh, some of this color I used in the sky. You see, I've still got it on my, my palette there. Um, and I'm just gonna drop that in and see what that does. And this is nice and wet. So as I drop it in there, it just it's going to kind of bleed around. 
Try to get some of that around that white mailbox there, and that's going to make that mailbox pop out. And there's some of that dark over here underneath these, this orange tree. So I carefully kind of lay that in there. Don't go too crazy with it though. You don't want to, don't want to uh, loop, you know, obliterate all this nice orange that I've got going down there. I'm gonna try to negatively paint, create a power pole. There's some kind of a pole right right back there that's standing up. And I, I can make these, let's say I wanna make these pine trees. So let's just do that. I love pines and I know there's some down around this water tower. Now you can see one showing up right there. So that automatically kind of gives it a more of a Northern country feel than uh, Southern Illinois, which is where I'm at. A little bit of symmetry going on there though. Can you see that they're same height, evenly spaced. So let's do this. Let's, let's make this one a little taller. And then do that and put a little fourth one right here. Something like that. So that adds a little more interest to it. All right, clean my brush. I'm not, re not real cautious about, you know, keeping these colors absolutely pure here. I, I try, but I, I don't worry about it so much. I just kind of dive in and I'll wipe, wipe them out later. Okay, so I'm wanting to get a little dulled down orange here for this tree right back here. So it's kind of dark. Is there a way you can do a picture in a picture, Barry? You know, like to bring that photo photo up small in the corner or something? Uh, not that I know of, I'm afraid. Okay. Technology is wonderful, but there's so much to learn with it, isn't there? All right, let's let's uh let's bring Moonglow into the picture here. There, you can you can see it on my palette. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, and I haven't done it yet, but you, you notice I've got a stack of old old watercolor cut up paintings right here, where I can test my colors out on. So you can see what Moonglow looks like right there. So if I throw that into these trees, that's going to give me a nice deeper value without being lifeless. So that's what I want to do right now. Just kind of drop that in a little bit. It's actually a uh, water, well, you, the water tower is there, but there's a water holding tank down right down below it that uh, it's a harvester, a harvest store, if anybody knows what that is. It's a silos they use up for, typically for dairy cattle, for feeding them in the wintertime and stuff. Uh, but they also use them down here for water towers, which is kind of interesting. All right, so I'm, I'm, I've got plenty of time. Things are working out pretty good. I want to come over here and just drink up this excess moisture that's, that's running down here. And it's running down because I've got it on a, on a slope. I'm going to come up here and drop a little bit of that, that moisture that I picked up. Just drop that in up there. That'll, that'll give it a nice organic foliage feel up there, kind of clustery. Don't be afraid to drop the different colors in. This is pretty well the, the um, moon glow right here. Something like that. Okay. Spencer, someone is kind of asking uh, the paint that you're adding, obviously, is, is very wet. How dry is the background that you're dropping it into? Like this right here that I just painted is, I mean, it's damp at best right now. This is totally dry here, but this is damp at best. This over here has got a little bit of a glare to it. Let me see if I can tip it there. You, you can see where it's really shiny there. That's what I've just painted. Okay, then as I, as I roll it, 
you might be able to see a little bit of dull gloss in, in other areas like here. Um, as long as it's nice and shiny, it will, it will, uh, it'll take the, take the, 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 the addition of the color to it or the addition of the moisture. Uh, but it, what it'll tend to do is kind of blossom out, but that's okay in a, a, like a tree like this. It just kind of gives you more of that organic shape, like a shadow up in, inside the tree there. Uh, but I, I, of course, obviously I'm, I'm painting slower than I would if I was just painting for myself right now. But it, um, I try to, you know, I, I try to keep it wet so that I can just work my way across there and, you know, keep it, keep it interesting and mixing up the colors. Like right there's a little bit of phthalo green I'm dropping in, counting on it to blend with that raw sienna and just give me kind of a greenish cast without, without being too in your face, too bright. Like we got some pretty strong phthalo blue right there that I, I probably normally wouldn't uh, allow to, to, to be there, but I'm not gonna go back in and modify it now. It, it really doesn't hurt anything. Okay, so I want to get this across here, trees, at that power pole. I'm going to just kind of paint over that power pole a little bit, kind of knock it down. It's, a, it's just, I don't, I don't like it, it's just too strong. Okay. So I've got a nice variety going across there. Um, this is bothering me. That's, that's kind of cutting the picture right in half. Again, thinking design and composition. It's, it's hard, hard to define. It's hard to give you a formula. It, it's very intuitive, I think. And I, something troubles my eye about that. So I'm just going to take and knock it down a little bit. And uh, it does, you know, it's just, I, I think what it is now that I've, not you know painted over it. I had a darker, cool color on this side and a uh, warmer, greener color, or you know, a darker, cool and a, a lighter, uh, warmer on this side, and, and that was like dividing them. And now by brushing that over, it's kind of leveled out. And I think that's that was what I was what I was not liking about it. All right, so we get over here. Now we got a a different kind of tree growing over. These are don't have any leaves on them. So this is a good way to just kind of paint those. Just take your brush and try to get some pigment on it, but not as much moisture. And depending on the brush you use, you can lay it in like that and get a kind of a, you know, kind of a perky jerky look to it, I guess. I don't know if that's even a word, but. Okay, so I've got trees that organically come up against this building here. And now real fast, I'm just gonna throw some more, more colors in here just to kind of get my values where I need them to be. Just pop a little bit in here around this building, make it show up more, that house. Grab a little green over here, a little pine right in there. Just a suggestion of it. But you see that putting those darks around the house, see how it makes that pop out there. All right, and then a little more over here. Throw a little bit in up here in the sky, or not the sky, but up in the, the canopy, if you will. A little less talk, a lot more painting, Spencer. All right. Love that going across there. That's that's working real nice. When I get that detailed out, that's really going to pop. All right, so now I've got to get down here and keep coming along where I've got got uh, dead grass and snow and things like that. So I'm just going to kind of try to mix that up a little bit. Just suggest it for the viewer, not not spell it all out. Little loose strokes to keep it suggestive rather than fully detailed. 
I'm gonna grab a little bit of phthalo green because if we get down in here, down in that ditch, there's some greener grass there. This was taken in November and it was an early snow that we had and that's what's, what's popping out there. So, you know, the grass around here tends to stay green longer right till the, right till you get into the bitter parts of winter. Like if you go out there now, everything's just dead and all, the, all these plants that are sticking up, uh, you know, the, the, the dead grass sticks, you know, sticks up a foot and a half or whatever. As, as it keeps getting frozen and the wind hits it and stuff, like right now you go out there, all that stuff's just laying down flat. It's just been, been beat down to the ground, literally. Okay. So I'm working on the, these organic shapes. Remember the, that was the, the target right now. Little moon glow, a little bit of raw sienna. Come in and pop this in here. There's snow on this, the the uh, on that bank there. That's always in the shade. Here's a, a driveway that cuts in right there. I'm going to put that in. It's kind of my identifier for it. And I'm just kind of trying to get this feeling of the the grass and such that's right in there. Add a little bit of phthalo green to it just for a little bit of interest. Let snow peek through there, pop through. Come out like that. Okay, so this right now is looking like a pretty heavy snow scene. Um, but we're gonna try to knock down some of that snow here in just a little bit. Okay, so any questions while I'm wrapping this step up, Barry? Well, you have a, a few people that have actually been to Big Bend and they commented uh, that it, while it is extremely beautiful, uh, there is no dependable uh, internet there. So we may, we may have been in trouble if that had been the case. Uh, that's, that, that was my suspicion. They, they, the place we were going to stay was like an old mining camp, and they assured me, they say, oh, yeah, we've got good Wi-Fi here, but yeah, uh, your, your definition of good Wi-Fi and mine may be two different things. So, so in the end, I'm, I'm glad that I, I didn't go. That's, I think it's much, much better being here. And someone else is commenting about uh, you know, the beauty as the colors are, are kind of coming together. Uh, someone is wondering, uh, is the paper fairly dry where you're painting now? Um, well, what I'm putting down right now, of course, I, I just laid these colors down over it. So it's, it's fairly damp right here. It's, it's kind of glossy and such, but this paper here is, is completely dry. So when I laid these colors down that you see under there, the paper, they went down on dry paper. I'm going to try something here. This this might not be the smart thing to do. I probably probably need to wait, but I'm going to try it a little bit. I want to, the snow that is on this bank is just really a deep, deep blue. So I want to start trying to save time basically and capture that rather, rather than waiting to come back in and do that here in a little bit. What I'm going to do is lay in a bunch of shadow over this here and just a like say in just a little little bit um and another thing too now i've got a so if if we look at this road here let me bring this up right here sorry about that on the, the camera there so if we we look at this road see how dark the road is and then you look at my painting you can see how light it is it looks like the road is snow packed so i need to do i need to address that and i think that's what's troubling me right now so what I'm gonna do is figure out what color the lightest area of it is here. Uh, well, you can see like, like right there, uh, that light area. I wanna paint that. And then I'm gonna come back in after that dries and paint shadows over that. So these shadows are, are probably uh, uh, moon glow with some cobalt blue. This will probably be a grayed down raw sienna here, the lighter areas. And I'll paint the whole road that way probably leave a few little white skips like patches of snow and then come in and paint the blue right, right over the, the blue and the moon glow right over that. 
after it dries. So that's, but that's, I'm, I'm liking what's going on here, but that was bothering me. And I think that's, I think that's the problem right there. Uh, I need to, I need to get this road a little darker. So, and I, you know, I could leave it as snowpack, but then this, all this stuff over here wouldn't, wouldn't be in, make any sense. So better to take care of that. Spencer, do you tend to use natural or synthetic brushes? Uh, I use all different kinds. Um, this is a, a rosemary uh, Kalinsky sable, half inch, uh, one stroke. One stroke is the length. The one strokes are longer than a typical flat brush. And they also, if you see the belly of it there, see how it flares out from the ferrule? That's uh, kind of like a reservoir that holds moisture. Um, this is a a brush that was my mom's. It's a Liquitex Kalinsky Plus, but I'm, I'm sure it's synthetic, but it's a wonderful brush too, uh, designed the exact same way. You see that how it's got, got a belly there and, and the hairs are longer than a flat. Um, I've got a couple of uh, point, point, pointed round brushes here. These are from Etcher. I just got them not too long ago. Um, I've been working with them and I really like them. They give you a really nice detail. Um, We'll see how they hold up. But right now, they're this is a 10 and a 12, and they're really pretty nice brush. And they're not that expensive. Um, and then, we, you know, I've got these over here, which this is the, the wash brush I was using a while ago. And then I've got a, a Robert Simmons Skyflow 2-inch brush here, $75. And this one on, on, on the right here, the dark-handled one, is the one I bought, I think, in 1993 or 94 and paid $35 for it back then. Um, good brushes, but they're both synthetic. So uh, to me, if you know, if your question is, do I need to use Galinsky Sable? Use whatever you like, whatever's comfortable. I, I use this brush right here, $3 at Hobby Lobby. Uh, you see the ferrules all rusted on it. This is one of my favorite wash brushes. So you don't have to go break the bank um, on the brushes. And I would say that for me, the most important thing is the watercolor paper first, second is the paint, third is the brushes. So if, if you've got, if you're working on cheap student grade paper, you cannot, you cannot achieve the effects that you need to achieve and that you want to achieve. It just, it just won't, won't do it. Be real careful. You see me blotting this up. I, I sucked up too much moisture. There. I got a light spot. It's going to be okay, but it, you got to be cautious. I, what happened is I drug it across there rather than just blotting it across there. So, okay, so where were we doing this road, weren't we? So I'm mixing up a, a warm, which is just raw sienna grayed down with a little bit of moon glow and whatever's on my palette here. And I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna leave a little light, a white paper ridge at the very top. That's my goal at the moment. But beyond that, I wanna go cover most, most of the road here. Not get too, too caught up in perfection by any means. See, that, that's helping out quite a bit, I think. A little bit more color in there. And uh, I, can, I don't know if you can see me on the screen, but I'll periodically look, look up at my picture, just kind of volley back and forth between the photograph and what I'm painting and try to get some kind of representation of it. And you see now the shadows are starting to show there. So that's working pretty good. I'm gonna grab a little cobalt blue here. Just re thin it way down. You can see it over here on the palette and kind of drop that in there to kind of give me a little bit more of the asphalt feel to it. It's still warm, but it's going to be, it's going to be a little more appropriate, not, not so intense and bright. Yeah, I like, I like that. Yeah, we had too much, too much white going on in there just a while ago. And you notice I'm, I, I'm trying to pull my brush in the direction of things are going like, if I was going up this bank here, you know, I'd go like that. I'm going down the road. So I'm gonna pull the brush 
just like that. You try to just mimic mimic the flow of it. And I don't I don't have to be perfect with it, but you just want to kind of kind of keep that same flow going. Okay, now that that just to me kind of looks like it's got a you know a little bit of snow patches on there. Again, I'm going to come back in with some shadows and lay lay them over this and re really make it pop. So we're getting we're not that far from finishing it really. Um, I believe I'm going to be able to finish it in the time allotted. Okay, and I'm right now I'm just kind of fiddling around with a little bit of. Where I feel like a, a little dark would benefit it. This is grass that uh, just where the winds blow all the snow off of it. There, some a little bit of green here, a little bit of raw sienna with the, with some blue, and that'll help. That'll help give me a grassy color, but keep it cool. Still got my little mailbox there. That's good. That's a good sign. I can come back in and put some more darks around that. Okay, so let's wind back to about an hour ago when I started painting after I laid the blue in here. I said I didn't, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do in, until I do it. So I'm at that point again. There's a lot of options available to me. Um, you know, I could work in these trees, but I, I tend to work all over the painting. In, in other words, I got I don't want to finish this out too quick before I develop like this house and, and decide if this house is gonna make the final cut. So um, right now what I'm feeling is this water tower, it needs to get, get to a, uh, a, a point of definition, if you will. And that means I need to shape the shape of it. It's, it's a cylinder with kind of spherical ends on it. So I need to paint the shadow shapes on there and then come in and paint that, that blue stripe on there. And so that's what I want to do next. And for that shadow shape, nothing works any better than moon glow. And I've already got some out here on my palette. So I'm going to try to keep my fingers out of all this wet paint here and just carefully study the where the shadows lay on that water tower. People may think I'm weird because I like water towers, but there's just something about them that intrigued me. I did one in an oil over Carmel, Indiana, three years ago, I think it was. They had, they had a, a pretty standard water tower, but this paint scheme on it was really nice. And the way the sun was hitting it that morning, I just I had to paint it and I ended up winning second place with it. So I was really tickled with that. And then a, a company, was, I guess they were work, built, working with a hotel or decorating a hotel. They asked if they could have rights to print it and sell prints of it at this hotel. So uh, they liked it. So it's one more reason to paint water towers. Okay, so you got you see the the, the coarse strokes are in there. So I'm just going to take. Take my brush, rinse it out. This is one of those round etcher brushes. This is the number 12. Blot the excess water off and just come in here and soften this edge just a little bit. Not too much, but just enough. That leg is catching full sunlight, so I want to be, want to be careful I don't obliterate it. And then this leg back here, there's a little bit of shadow coming down on it. Put it like that, and then come down. You can see how uh, how fine that the tip of that etcher brush is, and I can just make like little whisker strokes on here, like right there. And it's a really nice brush for that. Okay, so there's there's the general shape of the water tower. Now it's it's starting to develop. Uh, if that's if you find that's a, that's a little too dark there, I just take and blot it up a little bit. I can blot 
that one just a little bit. Okay, and I'm gonna take some of this moon glow and come in here, a little bit of moon glow and some cobalt blue, and I'm put a shadow under the eave uh, of this house here. Now, again, if you remember the photograph we were working from, I'll bring this up here. Just lost my picture, there we go. You see, it's like, it, just like a, a double wide. It's, you know, just not really an, an architectural beauty. It's just a, something very utilitarian. Uh, but I think it's better to take and and create, create a look that is one, pleasing to the eye, and two, more appropriate for around here. This is farm country, and there's still a lot of old farmhouses around. So it's, it's wholly appropriate. Now, the sun is coming from my right. So it's going to cast a longer shadow right here underneath that eave. Again, I'm, I'm making this up. It's, it's all that design stuff that we were talking about earlier. So I've got, it, got that eave there. And then there could very well be a little bit of shadow right here, just depending on how the sun is. But it's going to be smaller than if, if on the other side. And then I want to just pop in a couple of these windows here, just a suggestion of them. Like that. Okay, and this side of the building is going to be in shadow. It's white, so I'm going to get some more cobalt blue. And I want it to be a blue shadow. Try not to get it too dark. Carry it over into that tree there a little bit, kind of make it interesting. Now, one of the questions you got to ask, okay, do I leave snow on the roof or do I do I put a color on the roof? Right now, I'm just going to leave it alone. because I, I, The jury's out for me on that. Um, I'm kind of thinking these trees need to be a little darker too back there, but we'll see. So uh, let's cut across over to here, do the same thing over here, put a shadow under that roof there, pop a couple windows in, shadow under that. And not really liking what I got there, but I'll figure out a way to, to resolve it. So, all right, um, uh, Barry, do we have any, any more questions? Well, let me just go back and through the chat and see if there's a couple things there. Uh, someone is asking about the choice of warm and cool colors as far as creating distance. Would, would you use a warmer color uh, in the foreground and a cooler color in the in the background, or are there no particular rules about that? You know, that, that, that's a good question, and you, that's that's one of those rule things. As a rule, they are they are typically warmer up front, and as they recede, they get cooler. And the reason they get cooler is because there are uh, all kinds of atmospheric part of particles, moisture pollution, dust, uh, debris, you know, I mean, just, you can just imagine what all's in floating around in the air. And as you get, you know, thousands of feet to miles of air in between you and something, you know, like a, a distant mountain looks blue, that's because of all this stuff that's floating in the atmosphere. So yes, in theory, it gets cooler and bluer as it recedes from you and, and warmer and probably more vivid might be a better way to say it. Uh, as it gets closer, the colors have better saturation in them. Um, but that doesn't always hold true, like, like in this right here. These are all warmer colors in relationship to everything you see up close to you. This is all cooler because of the, the blues and the, the violets and stuff. This is mostly warm greens to yellows to oranges back here. Um, so it's, again, it's one of those things you just got to kind of use your intuition and don't get hung up on thinking well this is farther back so this has got to be blue it doesn't always work that way it doesn't always work that way but if you think about temperature of stuff and like okay like these are if these are warm colors here around the house I put these blues underneath here okay it's going to make the blues look more intense it's going to make the warms look brighter so it's going to make it look more sunlit Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think you do a, a lot of landscapes like this. Do you ever paint portraits? I do. 
Um, I paint a lot of portraits. Um, I say a lot. Uh, that that might be a little bit of an overstatement, but uh, you know, I, I paint portraits of people. I paint portraits of of dogs and cats and things like that. Matter of fact, right now I've got a I got a commission of a to do a cat portrait, and I got a commission to do a, a little child. Uh, they'll be done in the cat. I think is going to be done in watercolor. The other the child's going to be done in acrylic. Um, I and I I select the medium that that I just kind of feel the subject in. Um, you know what what I can I feel like I can best render it in. So that that's what what drives that. But I, I'm not really a subject driven painter. I'll paint it, it just about anything. Um, it just uh, you, you know I, I say I tell this story here. Um, I saw a really, he's a good friend of mine. He's a great plein air painter. And I saw him paint a dumpster one time. And I, if I remember right, the dumpster might have been pink or something. It just had a unique color to it. And, you know, who'd think that a dumpster would make a, a good painting? But it was a beautiful painting that I would love to hang on, on my wall. So it, for me, it's about how light interacts with something. That's, that's what draws me in. And, and that's what this picture here is all about. It's, it's going to, when I, the next thing I'm going to do probably is put these shadows in and that's going to, going to bring everything to life in this. So. Would you rather uh, work on those shadows now, or should we take a look at the slideshow that you shared with me? Um, yeah, we can run, we can run through that slideshow because that, that will allow me to, that'll allow me to, uh, maybe to help you understand what I'm looking for when I paint and why I pick subjects that I do and stuff like that. So yeah, we'll, we'll take four or five minutes to run through that. Okay, so I'm gonna remove the spotlight and pull up the slideshow. All right, so this picture here um, is uh, called the Heart of Mount Vernon and the white building is the, the appellate court building that's, uh, I don't know what the architecture is on it, but it's a beautiful building. Uh, it's stark white and got a, a wrought iron staircase going up there, if you can, can uh, see where that is at uh, uh, on the very left side there. And uh, it, it's just a great building. There's a statue of Abe Lincoln out in front of him. Abe Lincoln tried a case there back in the 18, what was it, 1850s or something like that. Um, and then behind it, the, the uh, red brick building is uh, the, the new Catholic church that they've built here in the style of the older one that they, they tore down. It was, was getting unsafe, but they, they were faithful to the architecture of it. And uh, so I've got an appreciation of, of them doing that. And then we've got uh, uh, the, where it says Huey there, that red awning is a, is a really neat looking funeral home. And uh, so anyway, I'm just looking at the contrast there that it, that's what drew me in. So um, that's a plein air piece, by the way, too. I think I painted that while I was getting my car serviced or something. Okay, so here's another angle on the uh, appellate court building there. Looking from the south, you can better see the stairway there and the, the silhouette statue of Abe Lincoln. Um, notice the pencil lines, how pronounced they are in there. I don't normally like them that strong in there, but that's just the way that one worked out. A lot of whites and off whites in there. Um, but again, this was, I was getting my car serviced right near there. And so I just walked over. It was late in the afternoon and I painted that. So, all right. Uh, can you forward that or is it timed? Uh, we're looking at a pavilion now. Yep. So that's over in St. Louis uh, in Forest Park. And I, I forget the name of this pavilion. Uh, went over there and painted actually not this painting, but it did a very similar version of this plein air and oil with a friend. And then uh, I came back and did did this watercolor version as a demo for the St. Louis Watercolor Society. And, uh, you know, just uh, notice it's an offset. Uh, you, you'll, you'll find that a lot of my design thoughts are, you know, I never put stuff right in the middle. It's always shoved high, low, off to the far off to the right, or far off to the left. Seldom do I ever push it far off to the right. Uh, we might see something in here like that, but, okay. All right, this is down in Louisiana. Uh, it's a ranch where I stayed at, an old ranch house. 
that was just the road leading in. Uh, but it's a good example of how the horizon and everything is shoved way down low. Uh, the sky is pretty predominant. And then I, I framed it in with this tree on the left that just wraps around and uh, just kind of if your eye tries to get out that way, it shoves you back down to the road and keep, keeps you looking where I want you to look. Um, acrylic painting I did down in San Angelo, Texas last fall at Plein Air, Texas. Uh, they've got an international water lily garden there. And um, it, it's really a unique place. There's lilies found there that are nowhere else in the world. Uh, it's not that big of a, a place, but it's really neat. And I love lilies, but they are a challenge to paint. And this one here, uh, I was really pleased with the way the colors came out in it. And just the simplicity of brush strokes in it. Um, there's some kind of dry brushing going on in there. Uh, there's toned canvas peeking through in places. And what was really fun about this, there was a, a bunch of school kids there that day. And there's this group of girls, there's about four or five, they kept coming around and, uh, Talk, talking to me about it, not ask their opinion. And they said, well, I think you ought to do this or do that. And we'd, we'd try it and they go, yeah, I like that. And so it was, just, it was just a fun experience all the way around. All right, this is a casein, which is not in my bio there. I, I paint in casein too. Uh, and this is a train yard over in St. Louis. I just snapped a photo going over it an, an overpass over the train yard. Uh, you know, I just held my phone up and click, click, click. And I get a lot of great shots. Matter of fact, the one we're painting tonight is shot through the windshield of my car driving down the road. Uh, but if you look at this, there's just, there's not a lot of detail in this. It's just suggested shapes and values, um, particularly the darks that go right, right down the center. Uh, and this arrays out nice. Now, you might say that that dark right down the very center, cutting it vertical, is a no-no. And I would agree with you, except I got away with it this time. Um, that's, you know, it, rules are meant to be broken. That's the best thing I can tell you. And if you can figure out how to break them, go for it. Uh, but this, this picture won an award, I think, at the Missouri Valley Impressionist Society last year. All right, just a, a sailboats at sunset up Grand Marais, Minnesota. Um, and I think the only comment I would have on this is if you, you notice the, the roof rooftops in the background, just they're just kind of suggested shapes. I did did a sky wash and in, in the reflection of the sky over the whole thing. And then I just started laying on the deeper values on it for the sailboats. And then of course you can see the the darker shapes on the on the mountain and and the negative painting around the rooftops makes them pop out. But very simplistic approach, but very colorful, very powerful picture. All right, this one here, we had a super moon about four years ago, if you recall, I think it was in October. And this is not too far from my house. It's, uh, uh, oh, I would say about two, three miles. It was, it was in October, I, I want to say, when, when we had this. Um, and I, it was a big news event, I remember. And I wanted to paint it. So I went and obviously painted it. Um, and this picture here, Plein Air Magazine did an article on this, the supermoon paintings. There's a lot of artists did it. And uh, so this, this one got into the magazine. It's called Ode to the Supermoon. And it's a beautiful, beautiful painting. I love it. I love it. And I love the fact that it got into a magazine. Uh, Mineral Point, Wisconsin. There's a Mineral Point is on built on a hill, smaller version of San Francisco, if you will. Um, and I just love the remember me talking about painting power poles and utility lines and things like that. This had it all, and of course, the iron staircase going up and the way it's attached to the building and the shadows that cut across the old old crumbly wall there. So I, I just, I was really happy with this painting. 
and uh, memory serves. This has been like five years ago. Memory serves. It's it won an award and it was sold too as well at that show. Uh, but that was a plein air piece. Uh, the thing that drove me, I loved the scene, but I was also able to stand in the shadow of a, a big building across the road, and so that made painting in in August a whole lot lot more palatable. Okay, I think that's the end of the slideshow. So thank you. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to get back to, to work on this. I want to get the shadows in. We're, we're getting down to 10 or 12 minutes to go here. So I want to get the shadows in and stuff. But feel free to uh, throw any questions at me. And I'll just talk while I paint. OK. okay so I'm going to, I'm going to grab a, I, I seldom to never introduce a new color at this stage of the game. But I'm going to try a little phthalo blue here on this water tower up top here. This this the, the uh, colored band that goes around it basically. Okay, so it's darker over here, and then as it comes around, it's going to lighten up. It'll naturally do it because the white of the paper, but also I rinse, dip my brush in water, blotted it out. And I'm just going to going to spread this around, and it just kind of just disappears there. Bring a little bit of it in right, right over there. And while it's wet, I can drop just a little bit more in. Okay, so that, that looks pretty good. Now, uh, the key thing with this is going to be getting these shadows in right. There's, there's work that can be done on this and probably won't quite get this finished in this segment tonight, but uh, as you, you assured me, Barry, I, I could finish it up and send you pictures and you'll send that out to everybody. Um, yes, so, but, you'll take a, a, a picture of the finished piece, then we'll add it as a long still shot to the end of the recording. Okay. And, and what I would do want them to see, though, is that, like what, what the shadows will do for this picture, because that's, that's really what it's about. And, and at its core, I could, I could put the shadows in and probably stop right there and have a successful painting. But there's much more I could do to it. I say much more. You know, there's there's another 15, 20 minutes I could work on it and have something even better, which is what I, you know, I try to try to do, opt to do. So, okay. So I'm mixing uh, moon glow with cobalt blue here. I want to lean my shadows to the blue side, and uh, look looking at the photo here. And I'm gonna go right up here and put. I still see those those hash lines that I put in there for a shaded area. So I'm going to go and add that right now, right over that little hash line. So I've got a cast shadow there, just like that. And I'm going to take and carry it right, right on up like that. Okay, so I like like that look there. So far, so good. Don't anybody tell me any different, please. Okay, and then I get over here, and this whole area is in shadow, right over here. It goes right up to that pole, and then it comes down like that. And so let me go ahead and fill all this in right here. That blue is cool, and you can see how it makes this look brighter up here. And now I'm going to bring this across the road. And in reality, there's a there's a bunch more shadows there, but it would just only serve to clutter things up. So I'm not going to put them all in there. And look, look at the architecture of the ditch. And right here, I'm redrawing my shadow based on what I'm seeing in the photo. I'm just, I moved it a, a half an inch right there. Right. And that makes the bank look pretty steep right there. So that's that's something else too to keep in mind, the, you know, the, the angles and things like that. And I there, there's so much I'd like to comment on that I, I, I haven't that's popping in my head now, but I know our time is limited. So uh, but like the, the angles on the road and stuff, how I, I've modified them and redrawn them 
uh, at different times. Okay, uh, I'm gonna get a little more of the blue and glaze over all this, kind of cool it down a little bit. Hit that real quick. Okay, you might have seen that that this brush, these Kalinsky sables, they will catch in the paper and then flick paint up. I that doesn't bother me at all that it did that. I actually kind of like it because one, that's kind of my one of my signature things that happens, just the way I hold the brush, and two, it adds an organic aspect to it. So okay, coming down here, hit this. And let's see here. I'm going to bring this shadow across the road and put a little bit of arc on them too, because these roads are crowned so that the water and snow runs off. So like the center of the road is probably three, four inches higher than the side of the road. So you just put a little gentle arc to it. See how the, the road looks, the asphalt there looks warm, where the, uh, you know, because that, that raw sienna, the warm against the cool there, makes that look brighter, more illuminated by the sun. Okay, bringing that down like so. That's pretty, pretty snazzy there. And a couple little streaks here to kind of break that area up a little bit. And then I want to put that big shadow down here at the bottom. So mix up some more moon glow paint. And actually I need, need to be using a bigger brush for this. Always try to use a bigger brush, uh, you know, and like right now, I. It's tempting just to stay with that smaller one, but it's not, it won't look as good. It won't look right. So I'm going to switch. So just going like this and just kind of quickly drag it across there, let it skip and get some dry brush effect on it. Okay. So I'm, I'm liking that, what I'm seeing there. Then I'm going to put another little shadow here on the ditch, just to kind of tie things in there a little bit. And again, if you get a question or something, Barry, just go ahead and ask. I'll... Well, someone was asking, is the, is the center of interest for you the water tower or the house on the right? Um, the house on the right is window dressing. Um, this, this is the center of interest for me, but the road plays a significant role in that. The road pulls you up in there and then your eye follows this pattern on up. You, you see how that, that you got this wedge shape going here? Your eye wants, wants to follow up there. So it actually, the sky kind of pulls you down to here. The road pulls you to there, the horizon line, all of that draws you into here. And then you, you go up there and you find that, so. Okay. So what what I would what I'll do to this I'll I'll probably deepen some values around the house just a little bit uh, um, and I, I'm not going to do that right now I'll do that after after we go off air here but I will show you I'll put in a couple power lines and things like that they reinforce where your eye looks um, you know again it's it's like like it, let's say this area right here is your center of interest. Everything should be radiating to that. The road radiates to that. These tree lines radiate to that. This, these, this horizon line takes you over there. And then when I put these power lines in, they're going to reinforce that as well. So that's the goal here. And you, you aren't going to be able to see that. Let me try to, try to get it where my, my hand's not blocking it. You don't have to put all the power line in. No, in other words, you don't have to go completely across. You can just leave a suggestion of it. Matter of fact, that it's far, far better that you do that. 
than to put it in and leave, leave nothing for the imagination of the viewer. Always be thinking about your, your viewer so that they can relate to what you're doing. Okay, let's see what else is there. So I can come in and put a little bit of dark right behind these poles here. Just a little, little hint to kind of finish them out a little. There's a pole right here. Let me just run that down like that. And let's see, go over here. There's some tree trunk shapes over here that I didn't, didn't get put in. This house here, I'm, I'm not really sure what I'm gonna do with it. I gotta, gotta think about that just a little bit. Put a dark base. I think a, a dark base to these power poles is gonna make them pop out a little more and make that look a little more illuminated, sunlit. Smear that with my finger a little. Let me put just a little bit of dark. I talked about this earlier. Just using a rigger brush here. This is a Sterling Edwards rigger brush. One of my, my favorites. Works great. Okay, so now we got a nice, nice dark in there that pulls you farther back down. So okay, so uh, we're we're at 8:30, Barry. Um, how, how does this how does this normally work? Well, I I think uh it's you know it's a lovely piece and people are commenting about uh, how well it has come together i think at this point uh, we can probably uh, let you finish it on your own and again if you'll send me uh, that final image once you're happy with it we will um, my it department will add it as kind of a nice long still shot at the end of the recording so that people can see how it how it turns out. Let me just see if there's in, if there are any other uh, questions here. I think just just very positive comments. So uh, again, thank you so much to you, Spencer, and to the Duke Page Art League for providing this art demonstration. It was really uh, really helpful and, and interesting, and uh, we learned a lot. So thank you, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I will send out uh, your contact links. Uh, as well as those for the Art League in an email following tonight. If you're watching the recording of this program and would like those contact links, you can just email me at ce at wheatonlibrary.org. That's ce for community engagement at wheatonlibrary.org, and I would be happy to send uh, that information out to you. Uh, but with that, I think we can say good night and uh, take care, everyone. Uh, stay healthy, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much.